morning everybody please come on in and and find a seat if you haven't yet welcome to church my name is zach scoggin i'm the missions and college pastor here at trinity baptist church at trinity we exist to proclaim christ and to make disciples of those who claim christ all for the glory of christ and if you're a visitor with us today we want to ask you to do us a favor there's a blue topped visitor card in the pew rack in front of you and we'd be grateful if you would pick that up and fill out that card and you can drop that card in the giving boxes in the back of the room, or even better, you can take that out the double doors to the Welcome Center, and there's some people there that would love to get to know you and, and meet you. You can also scan the QR code that you see on the screen or the, the QR code that's out in the foyer. If you're joining us on the live stream, we are thankful that you're worshiping with us today and would ask that you click the link to our Connect card and fill that out online, and uh, that way we can get to know you a little bit better as well. I hope that all of you had a, a great week spent with family and being reminded of all of the many ways that God blesses us. And we give thanks to him knowing that every good and perfect gift comes from him. And this morning, our study through 2 Samuel is going to bring us to chapters 19 and 20. And we're gonna learn the importance of showing grace to our enemies. And as the people of God, we are called to show grace to all people whether they are our enemy, our friend, our neighbor, or a stranger. John reminds us in 1 John 4, 19, that we love because he, God, first loved us. As we move into Christmas season, we want to look to the needs of those in our city, and we want to be gracious and loving. And this year, we are once again going to host a shoe drive and collect shoes for the shoe closet at Mission Amarillo. All of these shoes are given away to students in our area who are in need. Over the last year, Mission Amarillo has given away 1,473 pairs of shoes to those in need in our city. And we wanna be a part of refilling their shoe closet to start 2024. So here's what you can do. At the table outside the choir suite, you can pick up a shoe card and on your card, you're going to see the size that's needed and if the shoe is for a male or for a female. If you look on the back of that card, you can see a picture of the type of shoe that is requested. So take that shoe card, buy the shoe that meets the criteria that are listed on the card, and then return that box of shoes right here to Trinity by December 10th. And if you have any questions about the shoe drive, please catch me and, and feel free to ask me any questions that you might have. Before we begin our service today, let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, thank you for all of the good gifts that you've given us, for all the ways that you have blessed us. And we recognize this morning that we don't deserve the love that we have received from you. You loved us even when we were your enemy. And God, would you help us to love others because you have first loved us. We pray for this morning, for our time singing together, that we would lift our voices to you, God. We pray for the preaching of your word, and that we would hear what your word has for us this morning, and that we would be changed and made to look more like Christ because of the time we spend in your word. And we ask, God, that everything that we do this morning would be done with a pure heart that desires to please you and you only. We, we lift all these things up in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you stand with us?
Advent song this morning together. enter into a time of congregational prayer. Isaiah 12, 4 and 5 says, Give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Church, this morning, take a moment right where you are and say a prayer of thanksgiving for all that God has done and continues to do both in your life, in our church, and in this world. First John 5, 14 and 15 tells us, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. I ask that we as a church take a moment right now to pray specifically for Pastor Nate and his family as he's facing some upcoming scans and surgery. And then pray a prayer of intercession for whatever God has placed on your mind, 
whatever you are going through right now, whatever the people you love are going through, take a moment and pray for God's intercession. Dear God, we thank you for being first and foremost a good and a gracious God. We thank you for your many blessings. We thank you, just like the song says, we have 10,000 reasons plus so many more to praise you. We know our offerings of praise will always fall short of your glory for you are the holy God. But you accept our offerings of praise anyways. And we thank you for that. Thank you for being our provider in our time of need. We thank you for being a God that saves and a God that heals. We ask now that you would lift up Pastor Nate's head, watch over him over these next few weeks. We ask that you would continue to lift up his family and free them from all anxiety. Father, we also recognize that all of us have people in our lives who are hurting, who are lost, and who are struggling. I ask now that you would be present and acting in each situation that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I ask that healing would happen in lives, that loved ones would be freed from the chains of addiction, that wayward children would return. And God, I thank you for inclining your ear to us, even in our lowly state. And we thank you for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray, amen. Church, let's stand together once more as we continue to worship this morning.
I was buried beneath my rebellion Lost without hope of redemption Planned my need for a savior Oh, but God Crushed by the weight of my fear Living the lie I created Digging my grave without knowing Oh, but God, oh, but God Rich in mercy, how you love me Too much to let me stay Father, oh, but God, as the song said, rich in mercy, rich in love, how you pursued us, Lord. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jesus. Dear Lord, and as we turn our eyes towards Christmas, help us to focus on the real reason the birth of your son. 
help me, help us not to get caught up in what the world would have us see, but help us to see you, help us to see others and not task. Please help us to see others through your lens of grace. And dear Lord, we ask that you would be with Pastor Nate this morning as he opens your word Speak through him, Lord. Give him your words and help us to hear. Help it to change our lives as we leave this place, as we go out in this world this week. Thank you, dear Lord. Thank you for sending your Son. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Praise Team, for leading our singing this morning. Before we begin, just a few words. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to Ken Hansen and to his team. The room looks great, doesn't it? Let's just say thank you to them. <clears throat> Second, I want to say thank you to you, church, and to our deacon body. And especially to uh, Tony Carter and Rusty Raleigh, who uh, kind of take over and manage the entire uh, Thanksgiving gift basket. It, it wouldn't happen without those two guys. It wouldn't happen without the deacon body making the deliveries. And it wouldn't happen without you, church, bringing the, the goods, the, the non-perishable food items, so that we can bless, I don't know, 125 or more people uh, with a Thanksgiving meal. So we're grateful for you. Thank you so much. And then... I also want to say thank you for praying for me. I, like, I used to think I was the pastor here, and I knew what was happening in the services. Somehow I didn't know that was going to happen, and there's been several things where I had no idea this year where the, where the staff has made decisions, and I'm grateful for them. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a surprise for me, and I just want to say thank you. Thank you for praying. Uh, those of you who follow my Caring Bridge site know that uh, last week, I had to go to the emergency room, and uh, during just what was a CT scan to see what was going on, they saw an inflamed node, and it could be inflamed for several reasons, and the PET scan will, uh, tomorrow morning, it's been moved to the morning, so tomorrow will be uh, an important step in kind of figuring out what's going on. It seems to me like a lot rides on this, so I'm praying, and would ask you to join me in praying that this would be a... Uh, very explainable node, uh, responsive node to sickness or whatever else. I know a lot of you at the end of the sermon will probably be feeling the same way as that little kid right now. <laughs> so. Anyway, thank you for praying. Turn your Bibles, please, to 2 Samuel 19, if you will. 2 Samuel chapter 19. Okay, so uh, at Thanksgiving, you know what comes. If you see the commercials, you know that there are now like all these Christmas movies that are coming on, right? So you could pretty much turn on whatever channel you wanted and you could probably find a Christmas movie. However, on Friday of this week, uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, I don't remember what channel it was on, but they were showing the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Now, many of you have seen the Lord of the Rings trilogy. It was a great break from... Uh, the Grinch and every other Christmas movie that you can watch. Uh, we had a great time. Uh, we kind of sat there and watched some of the movies. And of course, the third installment in that trilogy is The Return of the King. And if you've seen the movie, you know that there's a lot of different storylines that are kind of all happening simultaneously. Frodo and Samwise are making the nearly impossible journey into the heart of Mordor so they can throw the ring into the lava there at the Mount of Doom. Gandalf and Legolas and others are taking cover at Minas uh, Tirith and ultimately they'll battle there and all while that's happening Aragorn is making it known that he commanded the blade of Andrew and is the rightful heir to the throne of Isladur right so this is important because the person who is the king the return of the king and holds his blade also commands an army the dead men of Dunharrow who owed their allegiance to the king previous king 
because he betrayed them, betrayed the people of Gondor. So because Aragorn, Aragorn holds this sword and he is the rightful heir to the throne, he's able to command this army and then at the end he shows up just in time and he helps to win the big battle there against the, uh, the army of Sauron. Lots of characters and lots of action, but one thing is for certain. Aragorn is the undisputed king, and he would rule the kingdom. Now, we've been in First and Second Samuel for most of this year, and we've seen how God anointed David to be king, and David took kingship after Saul, and David has been the undisputed king. However, there's been a lot of complications in the kingdom. Some of them have been self-inflicted complications. Today, we're going to see what happens in the immediate aftermath of Absalom's death. We're going to see that David is going to return to Jerusalem as the king, but it's actually a bit more complicated than that. So we're going to draw out some principles as we look to this text. If you will, please stand as we read in God's word. 2 Samuel chapter 19, begin there, the second part of verse 8, and read through verse 15. 2 Samuel 19, beginning the second part of verse 8, reading through verse 15. Now Israel had fled every man to his own home, and all the people were arguing throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, the king delivered us from the hand of our enemies and saved us from the hand of the Philistines, and now he has fled out of the land from Absalom. But Absalom, who we anointed over us, is dead in battle. Now, therefore, why do you say nothing about bringing the king back? The king sent, and King David sent this message to Zadok and Abiathar, the priests. Say to the elders of Judah, why should you be the last to bring the king back to his house when the word of all Israel has come to the king? You are my brothers. You are my bone and flesh. Why then should you be the last to bring the king back? And say to Amasa, are you not my bone and my flesh? God, do so to me and more also if you are not commander of my army from now on in place of Joab. And he swayed the heart of all the men of Judah as one man, so that they sent word to the king, return both of you and all your servants. So the king came back to the Jordan, and Judah came to Gilgal to meet the king and to bring the king over the Jordan. Will you pray with me? Lord, now as we look to your word, and as we see David returning to Jerusalem, we pray that we would look to the true king, to Jesus, the one who has conquered sin and death, and the one who we, in whom we have everlasting life. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. I can only imagine all the promises that Absalom made to all the people. Like a seasoned politician, Absalom won the hearts of the people of Israel, actually duped them into buying what he was selling. But now, whatever dreams those people had were, were dead. And they were buried under that same pile of rocks that Absalom's dead body lay under. So Absalom dead and gone, Israel now, we read here, returned home confused and uncertain of what was next. And the text indicates that the people were divided. Verses 9 and 10 indicate that these people were arguing over what to do next. Some were pro-David, and they say, well, let's, let's, let's bring him back. Let's make him king. We know that God had used him and that he had delivered us so many times in the past. But there was an anti-David division. We don't hear what they were saying, but we know like what they were saying. No, we don't want David as king anymore. He can't handle it anymore. He can't do this anymore. Beyond that, I guess, I bet that they wondered if David would respond or how he would respond to everything that had transpired, right? Would he seek to get even with the people who had sided with Absalom? Would he be cruel? Be he, would, be, would he be vindictive? Could he regain the confidence of all Israel and lead the people in truth? Or would he show favorites? Would he show favoritism? 
And all the while the northern tribes were arguing, there wasn't consensus in Judah either. So David sends his messengers to the elders of Judah to try to spur them on to get on board with his return. He appeals to pride. He appeals to his close family connection. And you may be thinking, well, wait a minute, David was from Judah, right? So why was there an issue? Why why was that even a a problem? Judah should have just jumped on board. But remember, Absalom was proclaimed king, proclaimed himself king, had all the fanfare happen in Hebron, which was in Judah. So there was clearly an anti-David faction in his own home town. And they too probably wondered, if they couldn't make the decision, how is David going to lead? How is David going to rule? But here's the question for us right now. Why did David reach out to the elders of Judah in the first place? And I think the answer to it corresponds to our first principle. First principle this morning, be proactive in pursuing peace and unity. Be proactive in pursuing peace and unity. Verse 11 indicates that for all the arguing in Israel, they had reached a decision. They were going to bring David back as the king, back to the palace in Jerusalem. So by sending word to the elders in Judah, David seems to be trying to get everybody on the same page. David seems to be trying to unify the kingdom. He seems to be trying to bring peace amongst the people there, the people of God. David was trying to unify. In fact, even by offering Amasa as the next commander of his army, he was showing that he wasn't about seeking revenge. He wasn't about seeking to get even with people who had been against him. Now, some may argue that this was a a jab at Joab as well, who David had likely had enough of. And while that may be part of it, it seems very clear that David is throwing a bone to Judah. Why? Because Amasa is from Judah. He's saying, look, let's let this, this together. Amasa is going to be the commander of the army. We can, we can all come together in this. Now, according to verses 14 and 15, David's outreach to the elders of Judah worked, right? The people of Judah got on board with this and they went to Gilgal and they're ready to bring the king back across the Jordan in a coronation ceremony as he was headed back to Jerusalem. So all is good, right? Everyone's on the same page, right? No, actually not. Let's skip to verse 41. If you skip to verse 41, then all the men of Israel came to the king and said to the king, why have our brothers, the men of Judah, stolen you away and brought the king and all his household over the Jordan and all David's men with him? All the men of Judah answered the men of Israel, because the king is our close relative. Why then are you angry over this matter? Have we eaten at the king's expense? Or has he given us any gift? And all the men of Israel answered the men of Judah, we have 10 shares in the king, and in David also we have more than you. Why then did you despise us? We were, were we not the first to speak of bringing back our king? But the words of the men of Judah were fiercer than the words of the men of Israel. So what's happening here? Well, the men of Israel are jealous. They're frustrated. They feel threatened because the people of Judah have been the ones who have brought David across the Jordan, were involved, maybe planning, carrying out, executing the entire coronation ceremony. And the people of Israel felt left out. They're like, hey, we were on board with this first. This, we had already made this decision. And you guys were, you know, Johnny come lately's and we had to bring you in. And, then, and now what's going on? Now listen, as foolish and as silly as this seems, friends, Disunity has been caused by a lot more silly and unimportant things in life. The basic problem here is that the people did not trust each other and perhaps did not trust King David as well. And as insignificant as this issue may seem to us, you know, who crosses the Jordan with King David there are some insignificant things that can cause disunity in a church family. Author and researcher Tom Rayner notes things like arguing over whether the church should sing happy birthday to members each week causes disunity. Or who has access to the copy machine? Or who has access to certain rooms in the church? These are all documented things. 
or if both the American flag and the Christian flag should be displayed in the sanctuary. Or, of course, the color of the new paint or the color of the new carpet. On and on, these things are ultimately not important things, but can cause incredible disunity and unrest in the life of a church. Now, some reasons are far more serious. Things like gossip, things like self-righteousness, things like self-centeredness, things like a hypercritical spirit that is never pleased and never content. And too often, friends, disunity is the result of failing to love one another and failing to care for one another and failing to have grace or show grace to one another. The Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians in chapter 4, Verses one through three, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the spirit, the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Friends, if we lived that way, there would be no disunity. We may disagree on things, but it wouldn't lead us to bicker it wouldn't lead us to bitterness it wouldn't split things apart if we live this way we would be pursuing peace we would be pursuing unity because we would be concerned more about the needs of others than our own wants or our own likes we should be pursuing proactively peace and unity. Another issue is that we fail to follow scriptural instruction, right? We have disagreements with one another. We, we feel like we've sinned against one another or we have sinned against someone else and we've been wronged. Oh, well, then we don't go to each other and seek recon- reconciliation. We don't follow the passages in Matthew chapter 5, verse 24, where Jesus says, look, if, if you know that you've wronged someone, then go to that person and, and make it right, We don't follow the passage in Matthew chapter 18 where Jesus says, look, if if someone's wronged you, go to that person. Go to that person and tell that person what's going on and, and seek to bring reconciliation to the relationship. Instead, too often, friends, we allow bitterness to take root in our hearts. We can be guilty of holding grudges. At times, we can spew out our dissatisfaction with the way things are to others, and then that gives them reason for offense. We complain about things. And friends, all of it is sinful. All of it. When we fail to seek peace and unity, and when we fail to follow what Scripture calls us to, we're living in sin, and we're jeopardizing the unity that Christ died to attain the harmony that we ought to experience even as a church. I I believe that some in this room may need to confess their self-serving agendas as sin and repent of of their self-righteousness. Just as disunity can wreak havoc on a kingdom, disunity can tear a church apart. And some of us need to hear Paul's words in Romans chapter 12, verse 18, that we should do all that we can to live at peace with one another. But the sad thing is, friends, and we see it in churches all across America, in this city, there will always be people who will not see their sin and will not seek to comply, submit their lives to Scripture. Well, the second principle to see from this text is that we to be gracious, we should be gracious with our adversaries. Be gracious with your adversaries. In verses 16 through 40, David is crossing the Jordan and heading back to Jerusalem. And he is met by various people, much in the same way that he was met by people on his way out of the city. And in verses 16 through 23, Shimei, the man from the house of Saul who showed up as David was leaving and threw rocks and and dirt and and was cursing David and saying, you're getting exactly what you deserve because of of your blood guilt, your, your bloodthirstiness against the house of Saul. You're getting exactly what you deserve. Well, this man shows up again, but his tune is much different this time. Let's look at verses 19 and 20. 
And he said to the king, let not my Lord hold me guilty or remember how your servant did wrong on that day. My Lord, the king left Jerusalem. Do not let the king take it to heart for your servant knows that I have sinned. Therefore, behold, I have come this day, the first of all the house of Joseph to come, Joseph, to come down to meet my Lord, the king. So now Shimei, his, his tune is a lot different, isn't it? But the question is, was his apology and repentance sincere? Unlikely, in my opinion. It's more likely that he saw the writing on the wall and was trying to save his own skin. And it seemed that way to Abishai, right? One of the commanders of David's army. In fact, he saw right through and he said, let's just lop his head off. Let's take care of him right now. But David's response, 22 and 23 but David said, what have I to do with you, you sons of Zuria, that you should say this day, be as an adversary to me? Shall anyone be put to death in Israel this day? For our, do I not know that I am this day king over Israel? And the king said to Shimei, you shall not die. And the king gave him his oath. So David here promises not to kill this man who was his adversary, who had shown to be his en enemy. David is showing grace to him, to a man that had been against, a man who had cursed David. He didn't have to. Shimei's actions previously had been treasonous. But what we see is that David shows kindness and he holds back his judgment. He holds back judgment. Friends, Scripture calls us to be gracious to those who are against us. Jesus tells us to love our enemies and to pray for them, Matthew chapter 5. Paul tells us, Romans chapter 12, to do good to our enemies. And this isn't easy. In fact, this is one of the last things that any of us would want to do in that situation. What's easy is to want to get even. What's easy is to hold grudges. What's easy is to give people the cold shoulder. But what if we treated those who oppose us? I'm not even saying they're your arch enemy, right? I'm not even saying they're your adversary. I mean, this can be in the moment. People who oppose you. People you can't seem to get along with. Maybe a sibling. Maybe a brother or a sister. Or maybe a spouse, even in the moment. You're, there's just disagreement. You're disagreeable. You're not treating each other with kindness and love. Or maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe it's someone who just, they, they just seem to not like you. And, and nothing goes well in conversation with them. What if we just showed grace? What if we just showed kindness? What if instead of trying to get the upper hand, we just humbled ourselves and showed love? And we encouraged and we cared for. Why? Because Christ has loved us. Because God has shown us his grace and his mercy and his kindness when we didn't deserve it. When we opposed him. Friends, Jesus shows kindness to us. Even those who are enemies. Even those who are apart from him. I want you to listen in Romans chapter 2 verses 4 and 5. Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Because, but because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourselves on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Friends, God has proven his love for us in giving of his son, in the giving of Jesus Christ who died for our sin. While we were his enemies, undeserving as we are, and now he shows us kindness and forbearance, and his patience is meant to bring us to repentance to recognize our sin, to recognize his glory, to recognize that there is life in Christ. But friends, even as verse five said, if there is not repentance, there will be God's judgment and wrath. If there is no repentance, there will be judgment and wrath. Jesus died in our place on the cross to take the wrath of God that we deserve. And when we understand God's great love and his great grace in our lives, we are motivated to turn from sin 
and to put our trust in Jesus. But if we reject Jesus, if we have not faith in the Son of God who died for us and rose again, then we will suffer God's wrath eternally because of our rebellion against him. Did David believe Shimei? Is that why he showed him mercy? Not completely sure, actually. But we do know that he withheld his judgment and he promised that he would not kill him. However, in David's closing words before he dies and he gives instruction to Solomon, he does encourage Solomon to take care of Shimei because of his treasonous, because of his actions against the king. If there is no true repentance, there will be judgment. Third, be loyal to the king. Be loyal to the king. Now, Shimei wasn't the only person to seek an audience with David as he was crossing the Jordan and returning to Jerusalem. In verse 24, we read that Mephibosheth came to the river Jordan to meet with David. He shows up unkempt as though he had been in mourning since David left Jerusalem the first time. Now, last we heard of Mephibosheth, you remember that the servant Ziba, who was supposed to be serving and caring for Mephibosheth, uh, told David that Mephibosheth wasn't there at the Jordan River on the king's way out because he felt like God was now returning the kingdom to his household. And you remember that Ziba played into David's emotions and tricked him. But now it's very clear here. At a, at a later date recorded for us here, though, Mephibosheth meets with David in Jerusalem. And listen to what he says in verse 26 through 30. David says, why did you not go with me, Mephibosheth? Verse 26, he answered, my Lord, O king, my servant deceived me. For your servant said to him, I will saddle a donkey for myself that I may ride on it and go with the king. For your servant is lame. He has slandered your servant to my Lord the king. But my Lord the king is like an angel of God. Do therefore what seems good to you. For all my father's house were men, were but do men doomed to death before my Lord the king. But you set your servant among those who eat at your table. What further right have I then to cry to the king? And the king said to him, why speak any more of your affairs? I have decided you and Ziba shall divide the land. And Mephibosheth said to the king, oh, let him take it all since my Lord the king has come safely home. Mephibosheth here humbles himself and finds satisfaction and joy in the fact that the king is returning to Jerusalem. Commentator Tim Chester suggests that based on Mephibosheth's words, it's clear that he was not after reward that he was not after vindication, but primarily concerned with the king's honor. In other words, he was more concerned with King David's glory than his own plight. Now this does make us wonder, what was David really thinking? Who did he really believe? Did he believe Ziba? Did he believe Mephibosheth? Is that why he just cut it in half, split it 50-50? You guys have it here? Maybe. But while we'll never know David's motivation, Author Peter Leithart suggests that David was testing Mephibosheth in the moment. Testing him to see what was he after. Did he just want what the king could give him? And if that was the test, then Mephibosheth would have passed. You keep it. I don't need anything. I'm just happy that you're back safely home. Well, next is Barzillai. This is the wealthy man who showed up with provisions for David and his army prior to going to battle against Absalom and the armies of Israel. In verses 31 through 40, this man shows up at the Jordan to affirm again his support and his commitment for King David. And David suggests that Brazilii accompanies him back to Jerusalem so that David can care for him for the remainder of his days. He can provide for him. Now, this man is nearly 80 years old or is around 80 years old, and he humbly requests of David that he be allowed to stay in his home where he will one day soon die in the city that his parents' graves are in. And what this shows us, I believe, about Barzillai was that he was not seeking reward from David. It wasn't about him being part of the king's entourage. It wasn't about him being part of... Uh, the group that the king would be caring for and lavishing gifts on. 
He was loyal to David because David was the true king. Honestly, though, it wasn't just what Barzillai did not take advantage of. It was what he did with his own wealth that also shows his loyalty. Recall that he was a man who had some means. He used his own funds to provide for the king and to care for the army. The way that this man utilized his funds showed loyalty to the king. And we need to hear that. Most of us don't have a lot of funds. Most of us wouldn't say that we're rich people. However, we have plenty and we have more than enough. And church, throughout the New Testament and the Old Testament as well, there is an emphasis on sacrificial giving. There is strong teaching on what we are to do with the resources and the money that God has entrusted to us. Some of you understand this. And because you understand this, you are showing loyalty to the one true king in the way that you invest the resources that God has entrusted to you. You're giving to kingdom-minded and gospel-centered ministries and you're giving to support the ministries and the expense of your church. And and because of that, uh, you're showing your love and your loyalty to the one true and living God, to your Savior, Jesus Christ. And some of you hear this, but yet you still Fail to invest the resources that God has entrusted to you in ways that honor him. You do not give to support kingdom-minded or gospel-centered initiatives. You're not giving to support the ministries and the expenses of your church. Instead, you're using the resources that God has entrusted you just for yourselves, to benefit yourselves. And Jesus warns us about what we do with our money. He tells us to stop storing up earthly treasures and to instead store up treasures in heaven, Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. And this has everything to do with what we do with what he has entrusted to us. Beyond that, Paul is very clear that God expects that his people will contribute joyfully and thoughtfully and sacrificially and systematically to ministry. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. Now hear me say this. At the end of the day, what you do with what God has entrusted to you is between you and God. But don't believe that you will not be held accountable for what you do with it. You will be held accountable. And I don't know what that looks like for you or for me. But we will be held accountable for what God has entrusted to us. Two more thoughts this morning will be done. Be certain the end never justifies the means. Be certain the end never justifies the means. Chapter 20 recounts the rebellion of Sheba. Listen to verses one and two. Now there happened to be there, that's as David is on his journey back to Jerusalem, a worthless man whose name was Sheba, the son of Bichri, a Benjaminite. And he blew the trumpet and he said, what, we have no portion in David and we have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tents, O Israel. So all the men of Israel withdrew from David and followed Sheba, the son of Bichri. But the men of Judah followed their king steadfastly from the Jordan to Jerusalem. Now, notice in verse one that the while the king was crossing here the Jordan, a worthless man, this troublemaker from the tribe of Benjamin, someone from the northern tribes, from Israel, started stirring up trouble. So verse two there where it says that all the men of Israel, it probably means to the the half who were opposed to David, they all left and they all went home arguing against David. The rest of this chapter records for us the steps that David took to squash this insurrection. As promised, David goes to Amasa and instructs him to call the men of Judah together. He, he is seeing him as the new commander of the army. Go, go and, and get the men of Judah. Go and let's get the army together and let's go take care of this. But for some reason, Amasa is delayed. So David goes to Abishai, who we've read about multiple times in this, and he recruits him to get the job done. Well, Joab, good old Joab, gets wind of this somehow and gets involved. 
And on the way, as Abishai is leading the army to go and find Sheba, Amasa shows up. They run into him, and Joab, under the pretense of friendship, kills Amasa. And he leaves his body there, bloody, wallowing in the middle of the street, and he starts to intimidate the people. Okay, all who want to follow Joab and King David, get in line, and let's go take care of this. Let's go deal with this. Well, it works. It works. The people now are following Joab once again, and they track down Sheba at a northern town called Abel of Beth Makkah. And Sheba's rebellion at this point seems to have puttered out because now it's like only his own kinsmen are with him, and he, he hides in this city, he hides in the wall, and And he there is seeing Joab's army come and Joab is there and Joab's about to take over this city. Well, there is a woman from this city who kind of stands up and says, hey, what's going on? So Joab kind of says, hey, this is what's taking place. And she says, hold on a minute. She runs away. She comes back. And the next thing we know is is that Sheba's head is being tossed over the wall. Like, End of rebellion right there. She took care of it or she had it taken care of. Well, Joab was successful, but he was also wickedly sinful in the way that he went about everything that he did. And when we consider righteousness, friends, we need to remember that it's not just the results that matter. It's how we got there that matters. This means that children and students You may obey your parents, you may listen to what they say, but you may have a poor attitude the whole time you're doing what they've instructed you to do. That's not pleasing to God. May mean that we as uh, employees take instructions from our employer and we do what we have to do, but we're not joyful or we're not, we don't have a good attitude about it. And that's not pleasing to God. Joab may have accomplished what David ultimately wanted done, but Joab proved once again that he was a treacherous and sinful person. Righteousness matters. Righteousness matters. And the way that we go about living our lives, the motivations that we have for obeying and for listening matter. Finally, be warned Rebellion against the king will be punished. Be warned. Rebellion against the king will be punished. Sheba rose up and rebelled against the king, against God's anointed. He may have thought he had good standing to do so. He may have even had some supporters. But in the end, he received what he deserved. And the same is true for everyone in this room, friends. There is one king, and his name is Jesus. And God's word is clear that all those who rebel against him will be punished. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. This is an eternal death in a lake of fire called hell. And sin is every word, every action, every attitude, and every thought that goes against God's will and God's ways. And the Bible is clear that all of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. There's not a person in this room, and there is not a person anywhere who can stand before God declaring himself or herself to be innocent. No one. We're all guilty. And we're all deserving of God's judgment. But there is hope. The true King Jesus, out of love, willingly took the punishment that we deserved. Dying in our place and rising again on the third day. In his perfect life, in his substitutionary death, and in his resurrection from the dead, there is forgiveness of sin. There is perfect standing with God. And there is eternal life for all who will humble themselves And who will put their faith and their trust in King Jesus. And this is available to anyone in this room who will recognize their sin. And who will put their hope in Christ. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. So where are you this morning? Where are you this morning? Have you experienced God's forgiveness 
Do you see your sin and are you ready to confess your sin and to, to, to cry out to God for forgiveness in Christ? This morning, you can know eternal life. This morning, you can know the forgiveness of sin. In our time of invitation here in just a moment when we sing, we'll be here to receive you. If you have questions about the gospel, we would love to connect with you about what it means to follow Christ and have the hope of eternal life. If you have prayer requests, if you need prayer, if, you are, um, if, if, if you're struggling with something else going on in your life, we would love to know and be able to connect with you and pray with you about those very things. Some of you in this room are now trusting in Christ and you're ready to be baptized and we want to rejoice and celebrate with you. Whatever God is doing, we want to rejoice. We want to, we want to pray. We want to be there because God calls us to that very thing. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, thank you for your kindness and your love. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for the way that you uh, show, have shown and continue to show us your kindness and your love, even when we were undeserving. And not that we deserve it now, but Lord, you're still faithful in everything. And you give, and you give. We wanna be grateful people. Help us, Lord, to be loyal to you. Help us to be men and women and boys and girls who look to you and give you thanks because you are worthy of all praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, would you stand and sing? From heaven you came right There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt Praise the
whether through song or through uh, the Word of God, I am thankful this morning, I hope you are too, for that reminder that our King, King Jesus, is returning. We look forward to that day and may we live our lives in light of that return as well, living for his glory and for his name. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we thank you for our King. We thank you for King Jesus. We thank you for the privilege of being yours. Father, we thank you for what Jesus has accomplished on our behalf. And Lord, may we live faithful lives. May we live lives that are committed to Jesus, committed to his glory, and committed to making him known in our communities, in our country, and wherever you would take us. Father, we thank you for the grace and mercy of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. You can be seated for just a moment. Church, my name is Tim Sperdito. I'm the discipleship pastor here at Trinity Baptist Church where we exist to proclaim Christ, make disciples of those who claim Christ, all for the glory of Christ. You know, in Hebrews 13, 16, it says, do not neglect to do good and to share what you have for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. And isn't it amazing to see the generosity of our church at work over this past week with with numerous Thanksgiving boxes being given out to our community. And I think, Pastor Nate, you said 120 plus families or individuals being fed. And uh, just what a, what a blessing that is. And I know that is pleasing to the Lord. And I want you to know that your continued giving is also a, an act of grace. That it supports the, the missions and ministry of our church. And we know that is a pleasing sacrifice to the Lord. You can always give through, uh, through uh, various ways, through placing an offering in the giving boxes at the back of the room or out in the foyer. You can give online at the church website or even scan the QR code on the screen or above our giving boxes. And of course, you can always bring your gift by the church office. Church, I want to share a few announcements with you before we dismiss. The first is Kids Rock. Uh, their performance of Messiah, God With Us is December 3rd. That's next Sunday at 6 p.m. here in the Worship Center. And I hope you'll come out and, uh, and just participate in that. And I know that'll be a blessing. Our women's ministry Christmas potluck and recipe exchange is Tuesday, December 5th at 7 p.m. in the parlor. And there are no signups required. Just bring your favorite holiday dish and then 25 recipe or copies of that recipe. You heard about our, our Christmas shoe drive from Zach earlier, and don't forget to stop by the table outside the choir suite on your way out, and you can grab one of those cards that'll, that'll give you instructions on what shoes to buy. Um, also, out on the tables, just outside the worship center, you see a, a list of Advent resources that we want to make available to you. It has a list of, of free resources to go through with younger children, some for adults and older children during the Advent season. You can also click on the links to those in the midweek update. That's probably the easiest way to do it, but do go ahead and grab one of those copies on your way out. Um, and then also March for Missions is December 17th. And in light of our March for Missions coming up, would you take a moment just to listen to an audio message from one of our friends? Hey y'all, hello from Central Asia. I hope this message finds each of you well. Um, I hope you've had a good Thanksgiving week celebrating with your families and just being thankful. I just wanted to send y'all a quick message and try to express some of my thankfulness for each of you. I wanted to just say thank you for how you pray for me and for my team and for so many like us, um, for how you give every year for how you send people like me and others, and then how you come and go yourselves. Um, I'm just so incredibly grateful. I know this is an exciting time of year, a busy time of year, and I am just really honored that y'all, um, again, for how you love and care for us. I wanted to tell you a little bit about what um, your giving um, goes to, just some practical things. Uh, 
every day i am reminded of how giving like yours supports people like me i am driving a car right now that is furnished by giving like yours i put gas in it because um people like you give I am able to take language lessons that get me closer to being able to um, continue to have gospel conversations with my friends. I'm already being able to have lots of conversations, um, sharing the truths of scripture and encouraging believers. Um, so things like that, when you give to um, the March this year, it goes to, to things like that. We're able to have um, literally hundreds of meals with locals and with local partners and with people who we are trying to share with um, just so many ways. I could not be doing one minute of what I'm doing without people like you. So as you begin to consider it this year in the March, I just wanted to, again, take a moment to say thank you for what you have done in the past. Thank you for what you're going to do this year. I am so excited to be a part of what the Father is doing here and in Amarillo and around the globe. And so thank you, TBC. I love y'all. I miss y'all. And I hope to see you soon. Amen. What a joy to hear from her. And um, yes, absolutely. We're thankful for what she does. And so many out of our church who are serving around the world as, as she is as well. And if you're not quite certain who that was, ask us after service. We'd be glad to share that with you. But March for Missions again is December 17th. Our goal is $200,000 and 100% of that offering will go to missions. It will go to the Mary Hill Davis offering for Texas State Missions, Annie Armstrong offering for North American Missions, and the Lottie Moon offering for International missions and we'll continue to to collect uh, certainly on that day on, November, on December 17th but also through the end of January. Church would you stand as we're dismissed this morning? Let's be dismissed with the words of Psalm 33 verses 20 through 22. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love for his wondrous works to the children of man for he satisfies the longing soul and the hungry soul he fills with good things. Amen? Amen. Amen. Go in grace and peace. You are dismissed.